zgodził się wystąpić na naszej konferencji, za co jesteśmy mu niezmiernie wdzięczni. Aleks jako jednocześnie artysta i <grych> możesz już się Miłka z wideo też wyłączyć. Jako artysta, a jednocześnie też astrolog jest idealnym wykładowcą na naszą tegoroczną konferencję i mam nadzieję, że zainspiruje Was i właśnie od strony astrologii, od strony sztuki. Hi Alex, thank you for accepting our invitation for the conference. It's an honor. <laughs> and since our meeting is about astrology and art and uh, you're the expert in both fields, um, and so you are a perfect speaker for our conference. Yes, and thank you. <clears throat> we're, uh, we're hoping that you might share uh, with us some of your experiences and practices uh, of both fields. And yes. We are very happy to hear you, <laughs> literally, literally. <laughs> and I'll give you a floor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Do you also see me? No, you see, only see, you see my screen now, no? No, we, we can see you. As a, and as the a screen. Couple. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I have to behave well. That's what I want to do. Yes, talk. you have to. <laughs> and you have one more hour, yeah? So Okay, whatever. whatever. It, it, yeah. It's one hour, okay? Because yeah. I was checking my phone, so I have a sense of what I do for an hour. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, so when we look at the signs of the zodiac, every archetype, Usually we learn astrology and we uh, learn to think in terms of psychological astrology or about events to happen, about characteristics. But of course, we can also see astrology with our eyes. We can see it at work. And there is a very interesting relationship between the psychology of a sign and the way it feels the space. Because usually we... Many people don't think so much about their proper relationship with space. It, with space, I also mean something like a room, like a flat, like a house, like a place, like a city. So we are always surrounded by space and every space is different. And every space has a content. And this is the interesting thing about comparing the astrological signs with their sense of space that shows also the psychology of the sign. So there's a very, very strong correlation. And of course, we never really see one archetype being 100% expressed by an artistic or a creative personality. Because as we know, every chart is a very complex composition of many, many, many different layers and components that sometimes even interfere. But nevertheless, I was trying to um, create a presentation where at least you can get a rough sense of what the archetypes somehow are about. So when you see, when I, um, when I just begin and I begin backwards, we can see that, for example, Pisces is a sense of space that wants to have a feeling of everything melting into a oneness. It's like you lie on the ground and you have the heaven above and you feel a, a total unity between yourself, nature and the sky. And um, the opposing sign, Virgo, is all about trying to find a system to organize space in a very practical or in a very sensitive and a very reasonable way. So each sign has a very different uh, perspective. Aquarius is the bird's eye perspective. The bird's eye perspective is the view from above. You look at things from above. You are not involved into what you see. You can see it with a strong distance. Uh, Capricorn has a very structural way of seeing structures at work rather than feelings or emotions. Sagittarius is never about the present. Sagittarius is always about what is not there yet because Sagittarius is about the future and Sagittarius is about something you hope for that it might happen. 
But we will look at examples. I'm just trying to give you a, a first sense before we start looking at the work. Scorpio is about the control of the center of a situation. You want to be in control in the center. Libra is also about organization like Virgo, but it's the aesthetic organization of a space. So it's about what, how can we balance the different energies in a space that they create something like a decent and an agreeable kind of harmony. I talked about Virgo opposing to Pisces. Leo is about the characteristics of a personality being right in the center. Because Leo is the center, it's the sun. Today we have full moon and I can see the full moon when I look out of the studio window, which is very beautiful. It's quite big tonight. I hope you can see it too in Warsaw or wherever you are. So um, Leo is about taking the center of a room and occupying the center and filling it with your personal energy. Cancer is about the inner containment. So when there's a big difference between a librarian way of designing a space and a cancerian way of designing a space, a librarian way of designing a space would apply a lot to contemporary aesthetics, whereas cancer would more apply to what, how you feel comfy and how you like to spread yourself and be at ease with yourself and the people. It's not so much about beautiful rather than feeling good. Gemini is a kind of a pre-analysis of the different elements in a space. So it's like a subdivision of space in all the different tangible elements that you can grasp. Tauros is about keeping the energy in the center. So you see there's a very interesting aspect on the fixed cross. You have Tauros, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, and all these four signs are about the center, but in a different way. And Aries is probably, because it's the roughest sign in the zodiac, it's the most immediate sign of just going right into a room and, you know, just looking what's going to happen here, what can I do with this space, without any major intention firsthand. And when we look at it, from this perspective, Aries, and I don't want to say this in terms of evaluating this sign, but Aries is probably the most unartistic sign in the zodiac because it's all about action. It's about willpower. Aries is about, I want something. And creativity is not so much about wanting something. You know, in, on, on Sunday, the Aries season begins. So this is the astrological beginning of the new year. And Aries is so much about what do I want and why do I want something or do I really need to want something? Whereas creativity is more about not what I want, but what I see, what could happen between the given material and my personality. So it's uh, creativity is an active thing when you execute something, when you do something, when you realize a creative project. But creativity has a lot to do with being receptive before you create, because without being receptive, you can't be creative. You know, the, the, the great uh, conductor Daniel Barenboim, he once wrote, it was also something like a political message. It was about when we play music, we have to listen to each other. It's very beautiful to say that. Because playing music means to listen to what the other people play in order to reply to that or to react to this. So the receptive aspect has, plays a very strong role. And of course, one of the most famous Aries artists is Vincent van Gogh. You all know him. He's <clears throat> kind of really well known despite the fact that he was not when he was born and the funny thing is he had a cancer rising as you can see here and Bif and Sagittarius moon conjoined Jupiter and Sagittarius and a strong Pisces emphasis in his chart and before he became a painter he wanted to be a priest and you know what he did? He was waiting for the people who would work in a mine in the evening when they would come out of the mine and he would stand there with a Bible 
and read the Bible to the people and trying to convince, to convince conviction is a very strong Aries energy. I want to convince you of my willpower or whatever. And, um, but those people were tired and they said, just let us go. We want to go home and have a beer and watch TV or whatever, but we don't want to listen to your prayers right now or what, to what you think you have to tell us. And um, so his life was very much about the willpower. And when you look at his painting, the intense orange, of course, orange, red and yellow are very um, Aries colors, intense. You know, orange is the energy of, of Mars. Red is the energy of Mars. Yellow is more the energy of Leo. But, you know, sun in Aries means a combination of Aries and Leo. So this orange is very intense. And you can see that in his work, the brush stroke is always very intense. It's like as if he would have been working with a knife and trying to cut something into wood rather than to paint on canvas. And then you can always see every brush stroke. So you see, even this is a cool color here. The blue is cool. But nevertheless, the moon is yellowish like the sun, which is something the moon is never yellow. The moon is always pale because it reflects. It's a receptive uh, planet. But um, even if this is a cool color painting, you can see the intensity of his willpower in every brush stroke. It feels like we have to say that Van Gogh, in terms of the academic understanding of talent, at his time was not very talented because he didn't really know how to draw a straight line or a proper portrait, things like that. So that's why people didn't take him serious as he was painting, plus he was using weird color combinations that people didn't do at that time, or he was one of the first to do that, but that had a lot to do, he had a problem with his ears, he didn't hear properly, which is also sometimes an Aries thing, because sometimes Aries don't listen, because they want to do something, they want to do what they want, rather than listening to what other people say, or, or intend, or feel, or whatever. So you see, there's always a focus on the center when you look at his paintings, and it's always like, it feels like, like something rough and it's like, like he has to fight with the material in order to get it to a place where he wants it to be. All right. And um, nevertheless, he developed a very, very unique language with that. Because the great thing when you have this incredible, incredible energy, but when you paint paintings, you don't harm other people or you don't fight with other people. You just... Let, let this energy out on, on your canvases. And so that can be very helpful. All right. We go to the next sign, Taurus. Taurus is about, it's a physical sign because it's an earth sign. And it's about keeping the energy, keeping the energy inside your own body, keeping the energy because Taurus is about food. The, the primarily or the prima, um, archetype of Taurus is food. It's not money because money is an abstraction. It's a replacement for food. But the, 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 the most essential thing is food. And so when we look at um, a typical Taurus painter, Jacob Jordans, he was a Dutch painter and he was a pupil or a student of um, uh, Rubens, who was probably one of the most famous Flemish painters of his time or of, or of all times. And you see the earthy, this is like gravitation. It's sensual, but it's also very a strong sense of gravity because gravity is, this is what Taurus is about. And people with a strong Taurus emphasis in their chart, they know a lot about the physical world. They know about physical quality, they know a lot about sensuality, which is a great quality of, of Taurus people and the necessity to feel each other, to hug each other, to see what is happening, what kind of chemistry is happening when we touch each other, this exchange of energy. And so this has a lot to do with gravity, like fixed on the earth. We, you know, it's like Aquarius is kind of, kind of the opposite of this because Aquarius is the total loss of gravity. Aquarius is afraid of gravity 
as Taurus doesn't like this kind of extra polled distance from Aquarius. And here you can see the strong influence of his teacher Rubens, but it's still a Jacob Jordan's paintings. And you can see it's almost like it's heavy, not in a, in a negative sense heavy, but it, you feel the weight of the bodies of these women, plus Taurus is a female sign, so, um, you know, uh, the, the image of Venus in Taurus is a very sensual, very physical woman. But it feels like everything is torn down to the earth. And this is a typical uh, Taurine image. It's Pan. It's the god of sensuality. So you see it's an earthy, earthy color. It's a strong gravitation. And it's, it's very much about sensual and practical um, visions of life. But there's another Taurine. Very, very interesting, William Turner. William Turner is a British painter. He's a fantastic painter. Whenever you go to London and you can have the possibility to see the Tate Gallery and to see his work in original, it's really striking. But he was, in the beginning, he was painting landscapes, which is very typical for a terrain. These are waterscapes, but he was also painting waterscapes and landscapes. And um, as he was proceeding in his work, his work, because he had very strong Neptune, in, Neptune influence in his chart, it was about transcending the physical reality. So it's very strong about the physical, but it's also about the metaphysical. So he's a typical and at the same time a very untypical representant of the symbol of Taurus. But when you see there are some drawings of how he looked. He has a statue, he had a very compact body and a very round head and a strong neck. He was a very typical Taurine. But this is happening when you are a Taurine and you have a strong Neptune emphasis. This painting is about a fire in London and it's the destruction of the physical world and the metaphysical impact of the destruction of the physical world. And you see, uh, the older he got, the more translucent his paintings became. It's so in, his work is so incredible, especially at the time when he did it. All right. Gemini is a complete different theme than the ones we had before, although they belong to the same quadrant. And when you look at it from a biological aspect, Taurus and Gemini are strongly connected in the body because um, the physical body and the, the consistency of the body is symbolized by Taurus. But the arms and the hands and the legs and the feet, this is Gemini. It's the possibility to move and to grasp things, to touch things in order to understand. This is what children do. They take things and they check out what they can do with it. And then they try it and they try to find out what is this. So Gemini has pretty often something very descriptive. So Gemini is more about drawing. And one of the most famous, you see 10,000 planets in Gemini with Leo rising is the German draftsman and painter Albrecht Dürer, who I would say um, he was a much better draftsman than a painter. I think he's utterly overrated as a painter, but he cannot be overrated as a draftsman. And he did very many, many etchings, but you always see the focus on the center of the image, which is the Leo rising. This is not the Gemini, but when you look at the details of the hair, these curls and stuff, this is Gemini trying to explore what is happening here, what is happening there. How can these elements Put, be put together in, a, in an interesting composition. This is a self-portrait. It, it's got something Jesus-like, I would say, but this is a typical Leo rising self-portrait. It's me, myself, and I'm looking at you, straight at you. Usually, in the past, portraits were done in a three-quarter angle because when you see my nose now, when I have a three-quarter angle, you have a definition of the, of the shape of my nose. But when you see my nose from the front, it's very hard to define the space behind the nose. So this was rather untypical at that time. Um, 
but it shows how strong the Leo rising, trying to become like a symbol as a personality. And then he did incredible etchings, woodcuts. Um, so this is more kind of a drawing kind of work. This is about the apocalypse, or this is, there's another one that is very, very well known. It's called melancholy. It's an image that's pretty often used when we talk about the planet Saturn. All right, this is an incredible lady. She's called Emma Kunz. She was living in Switzerland and she was a medium. So she was not an artist in that sense. And um, what she did is she took a pendulum. So she had a ring. She took her ring, put it on a, on a, on a rope. And she said, these drawings are really big. They are like one meter 20 by one meter 20. And they have a very, very strong energy when you see them in real life. She was far beyond her time at the time when she did that. Because when she did these things, there was a very materialistic and formal understanding of modernity because modernity was always about bringing in something new that has not been there before, which is a very scientific or um, sportive approach to culture. This was not about that. Her work was about, she was sitting there and she was trying to figure out the energies in a given moment, in a given spot, in a given place. And she had this pendulum move by itself. She had a Scorpio, you could see she's a Gemini with a Scorpio rising. And then she took some notes and she drew the lines and the patterns that appeared when she had the pendulum moving without her willpower. It was not that she, she did it, she kind of just received these movements of the pendulum and made incredible powerful drawings. So you see this is so, and these are very, very big. So if you imagine this not being small the way you see it on the screen but being really big it's highly impressive highly impressive and it's like the discovery of an unknown matrix of a world that we know is real and there but we can't kind of grasp it by the means of the earth epoch that we are about to leave as you know since december 2020 all right very exciting. So what she did was not about aesthetics. It was not about aesthetics. It was just about these energies, make, making them become visual. All right. Cancer. I took Rubens because he is a cancer with Leo rising. So there's a combination of these two signs. That's very exciting. So you see his work. There's always an, also an emphasis on the center. There's if you see, the, the main focus goes to the center of the work. Even here, because it's about the, the queen that's in the middle with a silver dress. So his work is always about the center. But when you look closer, you can see kind of these little cancer signs. They almost appear everywhere in his composition. So it's like the focus is on the center. It's very powerful. It's not gravitational with, you know, Jakob Jordans, the taurine. It was about gravity. But if you look at this painting, there's no, not, not such a strong gravity. It's about the movement. It's circulating around in, in different ways. It's circulating around the center, but it's not heavy. Even here, although these three ladies, they are down at the bottom of the painting. The painting has something light and very ethereal at the same time. It's very Baroque, of course but it's not gravitational. And even this one, because the center is white. And this is quite radical. It was quite radical at his time to put something white at the center, which is kind of focusing the center, but at the same time devaluating the center because white is not a color like yellow and red or green, you know? And even here, there is a center that we immediately look at. It's the front of the table and what's happening above the table and everything is circulating around the center. So you can do something. You can create a center by not filling it, but nevertheless, the attention goes to the center. All right. And this is a very famous and beautiful portrait of his wife. Okay. This is another Cancerian with Leo rising. Camille Corot is a French painter. 
And his painting is also about the empty center. It's about the center because when you look at the painting, you look into the middle right away and then you see what's happening around the center. So this is a different way to look at these kind of paintings because the first when you see this, the first thing you look at is not the two people on the left side. It's you, you, your focus is on the middle because the composition is such that there is an emphasis in the middle. And you can see it here too. And even here. And even here. And then he also did very beautiful, a bit saddish, Cancerian like portraits. But again, with a focus on the center. So if you ever have the opportunity to see Corot paintings in real life, breathtaking stuff. This is particularly beautiful because it's this is a composition consisting of this, this kind of format subdivided in three. So two thirds are empty and the lower third is filled. But that again gives an emphasis on the middle, on the focus. This is now we go from Leo to Virgo. Ingres was a French painter again. And Ingres was an incredible. I go through first so you have a sense. Maybe you have seen some of his work. He was Virgo with Leo rising. And um, he, oops, this is wrong, sorry. He was an incredible technician. He was an incredible draftsman. His work have the technique, how he could paint is just breathtaking, which is kind of can be typical for Virgo because it's about the precision of the details, as you can see. But you see, when you even when you look at this woman or when you look at the, the, here, the, she, she looks back. When you look at these women, you don't feel that they like to be there somehow. They feel like being stretched in the skin of a sausage almost. That sounds a bit weird probably, but if you really, it feels like they don't really feel well. It's not the Leo kind of thing like, here I am, look at me, I am in the center. I'm the best version of whatever you could get. It's like, can I be here? Should I be here? Am I allowed? And this is such a beautiful image. He did this in various versions of intimacy and timidity at the same time, which is represented like, I want to be seen, but at the same time, I'm not so sure whether this is really what I want or what I'm supposed to do or what I'm allowed to do. And the same here, when you look at this portrait, um, she's there, the dress is so incredible and the color of her skin on on her shoulders, on her arm, it, it's so incredible, but you feel that she doesn't know whether she feels right being in that central position. So this is the Virgoian influence of the thing. And here again, you can, there's always like a big question mark, shall I be here or not? But he's working, he's also working with the center because it's a mixture of Virgo and Leo but with the uncertainty of the will to be there. Because, you know, Virgo is like the second born. Leo is the first born archetype and Virgo is the second born. And the second born is not the same as the first born. The first born is in the center because here I am. And the second born has to step back because he's not going to be the successor of the king. All right. This is another this is a German romantic painter, Caspar David Friedrich. This is something very, you know, what people would say this is typically uh, Virgoian. This is also totally about the center, but it's also about a deep and profound melancholy. It's about the absence of the human being. Here, for example, this is called Stranded Hope. It's quite an extraordinary painting for this time because it has something very, very modern, what we would say nowadays. People wouldn't do these things at that time because it's almost abstract. And you look at the center and you see, you see the broken eyes, but this is about hope. 
and it's about stranded hopes. And when you look on the right side of the painting, you see a dark spot, and this is a boat that got shipwrecked in the ice. So the content of this painting is not what you see in the center, but what, what you see at the side of the center. So this is also a very Virgoian way of um, circum putting something into the center, but then circumnavigating the center at the same time. This is very, very, very beautiful and original. This is in Berlin. It's it's a breathtaking piece of, of painting. And again, there's something very melancholic. And you see on the down here at the bottom, you see little four or five little figures walking in the dark. But they are kind of going to the center. But the center, center again is empty. And this is another striking one that uh, honestly, I have not seen an, an original yet, although it's one of my favorite paintings um, I can imagine because it's so beautiful. All right, Libra. Libra is about the total harmony of all the elements. It's not, you know, every other sign, despite Libra, is about the emphasis of one element. And Libra is about the perfect balance so every element has the same value. When you look at this painting, uh, the composition is very light. It's Italian, it's uh, Piero della Francesca. Uh, to be honest, it's also one of my absolute favorite painters. And um, you see that there's a line in the middle. So the painting is subdivided in two sections. You could look at the left and you can only look at the right side. We have these three people on the right side and you have these figures on the left side. And there is something very light, elegant, beautiful. The sense of proportion of depth and flatness is totally perfect. But the painting is about a flagellation because you see Christ in the background and he's in a situation of flagellation. So the content of this painting is completely brutal. It's an awful, it's about torture. But the way he represents it, then you see this kind of violetish blue sky in the background. It's, it's put into an aesthetic harmony that transcends the physical cruelty that's happening on, in this painting. This one is in London in the National Gallery. It's also Piero della Francesca, and you can also see here, there is something in the center, but the elements are so balanced that you have, um, you have the, the lower part of the, of the painting ends at the head of the Madonna, and then the upper part is only about the architecture. And this gives the space, but because when you just look at the lower part and you look at the figures, they are not painted in a way that it creates such a deep space but the space comes from the architecture above. So it's like above and below in perfect harmony. This painting again is, because usually when you look at Madonna paintings, at, at Christ paintings, the emphasis is completely on the Madonna. But here it's not. This is uh, another incredible painting by Piero della Francesca. It's about the idea of the perfect city. So this is like, the idea of architectonical perfection. And the ones of you who have been in Italy, this is always when we come to Italy for the first time, we, everyone has a cultural shock because the sense of aesthetics in Italy is so incredibly high and strong. And, but this is the level of perfection that we can allow because what the Italians could always do, especially in the past, in the Renaissance, this is Renaissance, uh, um, is from the Renaissance time. They always have a sense of aesthetic that includes vitality. So it's never a cold sense of perfection. It's like including the edginess and the imperfection. This is another one, very, very interesting. Um, Le Corbusier is a French architect and this is a very airy horoscope. So he had a Sun Uranus conjunction in Libra, a Gemini rising and a Gemini moon and a Gemini Pluto. So it's a very airy figure. And this 
uh, portrait of him is cool because it feels like you look at this guy and it's like his drawings and his ideas on the, on the, on the blackboard are like, it's all in his mind. It's coming out of his mind. And he has done very light architecture. You see the, the, the chairs are very famous. I mean, everybody has seen these chairs at some point in their life. And his architecture is very open with big windows and light pouring in from every side and, and the nature coming in from every side. This is one of his famous chair, other famous chairs. This is the one that you saw in, in the in the room before and this is the building from the outside so it's something very very light it's very conceptual it's almost the total opposite of the gravity of a taurine when you when you think about a taurine way of living would be a cave compared to this building this is the very famous church of ronchon it's in france and there's a thing on the inside that's pretty beautiful. I mean, it's awful material because it's concrete and it's kind of very rough. But the, the play with the light and the colors gives lightness to the heaviness and the stiffness of this material. But since he was, um, you know, he was very Uranian and the problem is always when there's too much emphasis on one element in a child, it can get too much. And uh, the shadow side of Aquarius is the tendency to be too conceptual. And there's an, a type of architecture that we call brutalismo, brutalism. And so he had social concepts of coexistence of, of uh, um, cities, of, uh, um, um, you know, banlieue. What is banlieue? It's like, you know, the on the on the outskirts of a, of a town when you have to create new situations for people who can live. And so this almost looks like Russian um, communist architecture. It's like the concept is much stronger than the sensitivity for how it feels to live in these buildings. So he, the, the variety of what Corbusier did in his life was from high light elegance to rough, strict, um, uh, brutalism and he, it's said that he was also sympathizing with fundamentalistic ideas why, whether they would come from the right or the left wing this is always a big danger when the element air is stronger than all the other elements because despite the fact how great an idea can be it still always needs to have a repercussion in the physical and emotional world of course <clears throat> Scorpio this is a complete different number Picasso was a Scorpio with Leo rising and his paintings were very much about the destruction of the center. So the destruction of the center, because it's like you need the center, but Scorpio is about destroying the power in the center in order to find out if there is something behind. And um, you see, Picasso was known, he was very radical when he was working and um, he, he would paint and then he would change it again. He would destroy it and try again, which is something many people could never, could never stand doing because, you know, usually when we do something, we start to like things and then we stay with these things. But he was very extreme, which is great when you are creative. And when he felt it's not where it can be because the essence of Scorpio is trying to get the most in the strongest intensity and the biggest vitality so scorpio is either about the suppression and destruction of life or it's about vitalizing the core of the essence of vitality and creativity and so when you start to work and you always change it and change it because you feel there's more there's another level and despite the fact that it looks nice and cool no it's not where it's could be and i'm trying to find more and more and more so this is a constructive destruction it's not a destructive destruction many people don't know that he was actually called pablo ruiz and his mother's name was picasso so his the name under which he be, he became famous is his mother's name and he was a scorpio and had the moon in the fifth house so he had a very strong um submissive 
attitude towards women, and then he was a Scorpio with Leo rising and Mars in the 12th house, and he was a small man, which is tricky for somebody with these energies. So he felt he has to take revenge for this feeling of submissiveness towards the female sexuality and the female power. So he kind of felt overpowered and he was trying to fight this feeling of being overpowered. That's also why he was into the minor tower and into the bullfight of Spanish tradition. All right, this is another one. You wouldn't want to meet this guy at midnight in the park. And if the park is dig, uh, big and he would all of a sudden show up in a bush, you would just take your feet and run away. This is Francis Bacon. It's um, He had Scorpio Sun and he had very, very tight aspects between um, Saturn, Mars, Neptune and Pluto. So he had a Mars-Pluto square, Saturn-Uranus, Neptune square, and he was a Scorpio with a Taurus moon. His painting is also, so that's why I think he must have a Leo rising. His paintings are pretty often about also the center, but here you can physically see the destruction of the center because his painting was about he would paint something on the canvas and then he would take something like a scratcher and scratch it away and work over this again and so he would physically destroy the painting in order to create something and this is a very famous thing and it's really interesting on the left side you see um oh i see something does that make a difference probably um, on the left side is a very famous painting of the Pope by the wonderful Spanish painter Velázquez, Diego Velázquez, who is another of my all-time favorites. My first painting in oil was a copy, was a copy of a Velázquez painting. Mm. And uh, Francis Bacon had a very terrifying relationship with his father. And he was beaten by his father. This is the way education was happening at that time also later and he was beaten so strong and um he became homosexual and he started to have an affair with the guy who was in charge of the horses of his father and so he was suffering all his life from the dominance of the paternal archetype and so when you see this portrait of a pope this is like the destruction of the image of the of the holy paternal father figure. And then you know that the the Pope in Italian is called Papa, il Papa. So the destruction of the Pope is the destruction of the archetype of the Papa. And so since he wasn't a Papa himself physically, um, he he transformed these energies into these really wild crazy intense paintings that have a very strong emphasis uh, that he never made a school but he did a long a lot of series on this destruction of the pope but you see when you do this on an artistic level you don't harm nobody doing that it's you know it's an extreme image of the existential status quo of the psychology of the human being in the 20th century, especially looking at the potential nuclear war. So people felt like that his images have a lot to do with how do people feel in a world that could be destroyed within a few minutes. Um, this is another, this was more something like an early painting. So it's nothing that you would, this is not very librarian, you know, it's like, it's, weird weird figures things you wouldn't have you wouldn't probably want to have in your sleeping room and this is an image of the crucifixion the crucifixion was another image that he would use very often so it's always the undoing of an archetypical image so here's a combination of the crucifixion and meat and the pope and that's a, a very funny portrait of him as a younger man another one is robert maplethorpe a triple Scorpio, Sun, Jupiter, Mars, and rising sign in Scorpio, and a Pisces moon. 
And that's a self-portrait. But he's not in the center. So you don't know whether, he, because the focus is on the ear, it's, you know, and you could, you could subdivide the painting and in the middle, if you, if you would put a cross on, the, on, on this, that's not a painting, excuse me, on this photography, the middle would be black and empty. And you don't know what is more important, the skull or the face in the background. The skull is more important. Death is more important. This is so scorpionic. This is another self-portrait. So it's, it's the edginess of can I be there or not, but not in the way Virgo would do this as we were saying, but in a way, um, it's like, it's, life is dangerous. You see, here's another uh, self-portrait. This is a very famous self a portrait of um, a, an American sculptor. Very beautiful. But again, she's off-center, you can see. This, he was also gay, so he made, this is two of his friends. So, Sagittarius. Sagittarius is from the center to the periphery. So Sagittarius is not about the center. This is Tintoretto. I just show you some paintings so you have a sense of this world. This is like a crazy world, totally crazy. But you always feel there's a pull out of the center. It's like the energy doesn't want to stay. It wants to run away or fade out of the image. It, here you can see it's, it's, there is Christ in the middle, but the dynamic of the painting with the table goes diagonal and it goes, it's, it's like it would slip out of the canvas. So it's nothing, everything is trying to run away somehow, you know. And this is what Sagittarius is about. Sagittarius is never about here and now. Sagittarius is about tomorrow or the day after tomorrow or the week after next week's week. Even here, this is a more conventional early work of his. But nevertheless, there's no nothing quiet in this painting. And even here, it feels like somehow the composition is weird. You don't really understand the composition. It's kind of a very un unorthodox composition. So if you ever have the chance here again, it could also be what you see if you blur your eyes a bit, it could be just clouds looking at a fragment of clouds. If you ever have the chance to be in Venice and you can go to the Scuola Grande di San Rocco and look at this work in original, it's breathtaking. It's just fucking breathtaking, his work. Tintoretto. And here again, the dog is more significant and has more weight than the empty table. But this is the last cena, the last supper. This painting is about the last supper. But the table is empty and the dog is in the middle. It's almost cynical. And it's such a wild composition. You don't know where is, who is going where and what's happening here, you know? If you remember Piero de la Francesca, this perfect aesthetic composition. All right. This is a friend of mine, a great painter. He's Taurus with Sagittarius rising. And this is a great combination because his work is always about people that have a certain weight, a psychological weight, but they're all flying in the air. So it's about a world where everything is lifting up into the air. And there you can feel the earthboundness of Taurus, but at the same time, it's always like another world. He also has got sun opposing Neptune. And then this turquoise, in my understanding, is a very strong Sagittarius color. I mean, it's hard to put one color to a sign, but there is always a combination of color. But here you see there's a combination of turquoise with green, and I see this is a very strong um, Sagittarian coloring. This is very, very taurine, of course. This is almost like Jakob Jordans, the guy in the very beginning, but then you see the shadow is, you know, if you would see this kind of, this is like a piece of meat. 
And if you would see this on the on, even on the snow, the shadow would never be blue. But here the shadow is blue. So there is this element of uplifting this, but this is really the Turian side of this cap thing. Capricorn, Robert Rauschenberg, um, was an American artist, and Capricorn is about the reality as it is. So Capricorn is the, the social reality as we know it. And Cap um, Robert Rauschenberg is a Capricorn, and he was one of the first people who used images from social media that were there. So he didn't invent them. This is an image of JFK. You see his hand twice. You see something from the people landing on the moon. You see some geometrical figures. He would always take things he, they, that were part of what we call reality. This is what Capricorn is about. Capricorn is accepting the reality that we agree upon is reality. That's why Capricorns often have a better relationship to laws and rules than other signs, because they say, this is life, this is how we agree upon life, what life is supposed to be, and we accept it. So this is a way he, he would work with fragments of given reality and combine them in an impersonal way, because he would print them. In this case, it's printed on aluminum. And he would make some drawings into this, but it was very imp there's something very impersonal in this work. You see, this is all like, it's almost like we could think it's political. It's not political in terms of the content is political, but it's like working with what's there. And then I found this. And what you see on the left side is his birth chart. Because I saw the thing, I saw this work, and I, I said, like, what did he do here? And then I saw that this is really his birthday, and then I could find out where he was born, and then I could calculate this chart, so I found out his birth data, because his birth data is not public, but this is his birth chart. And then I saw, this is a self-portrait, really, really, both. Uh, both, sorry, I have to say this, both are self-portraits. So he says, a, self, a public Capricornian self-portrait is my bones, the physical structure, my horoscope. On the right side, what you see is he, he did a performance and that was publicly accepted and renowned. And in the middle, it's something like an abstract version of a fingerprint. And here again, you can see um, this is his body. So he says, my reality is what, this, what, what society conveys as part of my substantial reality. And underneath here, on this paper, I don't know if you know Ebertin, um, he was a German astrologer, and he had created formulas <clears throat> where you could make diagrams of the movements of the planets during a year, and then you would draw the lines of your own chart, and you had a visual way of looking at a year and see in which phases of the year you have certain astrological um, challenges or opportunities. And you see these red lines, these are the, the, the cycles of the planets during a year. So it's interesting that he was using astrology twice. Um, this is another thing. This is a building from somebody with Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. So this is a person who has Capricorn planets, Aquarius and Pisces planets. This is a building that is open for guests and it's elegant but very neutral. And it's, you know, the Aquarian side brings in the openness. The Piscean side means it's just on the sea. It's right on the sea. And, but it needs to be, this building is like a beautiful structure. But it needs to be filled with life by the people who come to live in this building. So this is like perfect, almost like a catalog, probably. Um, and everything is practical because the, the architect is a, is a Capricorn. Um, but it needs people to come in because otherwise it would look like a museum, you know? All right. Aquarius. Aquarius is the maverick, 
Aquarius is the bird's eye perspective on things. Aquarius is the biggest distance to the subjective way of looking at things. So it's like, it's not about what I feel is happening here. It's about what is happening. Can we be objective about understanding what's happening? And uh, Jeff Koons is one of the most, um, how can I say, celebrated artists in the United States. And his work is all about the reflection of the personality via the means of social media and publicity, or in this case, pornography. Here you can see this is a, a version of um, uh, um, Michael Jackson. It's, so he's working with kitsch, and that means he's trying to create a discourse about what's happening in society, but it's complete, his work is completely impersonal. And he also doesn't do it himself. He has people who, these are paintings and he has people, who, he has a factory. He doesn't do things, these things by himself. <clears throat> then we have the famous German painter. Um, Isa, can I have a very few minutes more? Say peep. Yes, sure. So anyway, this is the German painter uh, Baselitz. And he's a typical Aquarian because he was painting all his paintings. These are early paintings. He started to fragment the figures. And then he started to change the motifs and paint them upside down. So he was making paintings with all the figures upside down, which is a typical like see the things from another perspective upside down. And he's one of the most famous German painters. And this is really interesting. This is Gerhard Richter. And um, Gerhard Richter is probably the most famous painter of our time. He's German. And <clears throat> I studied with him for a year or two. So I knew him also personally. And um, he's a double Aquarian with Mars and Mercury in Aquarian. And very interesting, Saturn in the 12th house. And you know, when you look at the 12th house, it's what's going to happen at the end of your life. Some people say the fourth house, but the fourth house is coming back and getting another sense of your origins and who you have been in terms of where you come from and who you have become. And so your relationship to who you are now and in relationship to where you come from. But when it's about the end of your life, it's about the 12th house is the leftover. So when you look at a chart and some people have planets in the 12th house, this is coming at the end of the life. And he started in the 60s with bird's eye perspective paintings, so-called cityscapes. Plus they were all in gray, white and black but mostly gray tonality and gray is the color of Aquarius because gray is the absence of color. And at the same time, when you take all the colors and you mix them, you have gray. So gray is contains every color and at the same time it's no color. And this is also very typical for Aquarian. It's like the distance to a subjective because color is an energy and an energy is also an emotion. So when you look at, remember the very beginning, Van Gogh, orange, red, yellow, turquoise, dark blue. It's all about feelings and, you know, Sagittarius moon, Cancer rising, Aries. It's like, how do I get all these feelings onto one thing? And this is something that Aquarians don't really like. So this is about being neutral, emotionally neutralized in order to be able to keep the bird's eye perspective. So he started with this. And at that time, then he started to paint black and white, blurry black and white things from his um, family album, because at that time, art was not about psychology, nor about soul, nor about content. And he said, I'm just doing this because I'm it's indifferent. I have no opinion. I have no feelings. So I can paint everything because 
it's neutral. It's not about something real. And he also had very depressive phases and he would paint gray traces of color and he wouldn't, he didn't know where to go. And then he also started these incredible that remind us a bit about Caspar David Friedrich, um, photo, photorealistic landscapes that are also kind of considered to be very German. And um, when you see them on a photograph or on a postcard, they are very romantic. But when you see them on original, they are something very distant. Because, you know, painting is something, I, I mean, I make a presentation with a lot of paintings. But in real life, you have to see this stuff. It's like a human being. If you see somebody uh, virtually on the internet or somebody comes to your room, it's a completely different number. So his paintings, some of his paintings are romantic, but they are very cool and original. And then, you know, then he, this is also typical Aquarian, kind of grayish clouds, the bird's eye perspective, because the, this is where the birds are. And then he did abstract paintings with kind of all colors. He didn't take real decisions. This is not, this is a nice painting. Don't misunderstand me with what I say now. But in terms of color, this is not really composed. It's like he's taking things and trying to be neutral with a lot of color. And um, this is his daughter, Betty. And there's an incredible story. This is him. At, in, in the year 2004, he had transiting Neptune on his Aquarian sun. And you know, what does Neptune do? Neptune is a veil, a veil to protect us from something we don't want to see. That's what we also sometimes call an illusion. And um, so a Neptune transit can be a disillusionment, but it can be a very constructive disillusionment. And um, Gerd Richter had, when he was young, this is him as a baby, and this is his uh, aunt, Aunt Marianne, and he loved Aunt Marianne, but um, Aunt Marianne was a bit, uh, had psychological problems, and this was during the Second World War, and he was living in Dresden, and Aunt Marianne was taken by the Nazis into a hospital, and they killed all the mentally ill people at that time. That was called an euthanasia program by the Nazis and that was very painful for him so uh, when Neptune came to his natal son and a journalist made an incredible discovery Gerd Richter married this lady and this was her father so this is his first father-in-law and this journalist found out that this guy called Uncle Rudy was actually the murder of his aunt Marianne something that he never knew until 2004 when this journalist made these incredibly incredibly complex discoveries so he had painted himself and his um the, the murder of his uh, 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 beloved aunt and the daughter of his of the murder of his beloved aunt and he painted her descending into the cave which psychologically is always interpreted of descending into your own unconsciousness and then he had this daughter called Betty with this lady and this is really striking Betty was born the same day as his aunt Marianne, but seven multiplied seven, that means 49 years, the same day. Um, and so this correlation, this interrelation is so incredible. And he, as an Aquarius, he didn't want to see that. And all of a sudden, all the relationship of everything he had ever done in his painting changed completely. All right. He's already nowadays. He's on a on a on a postmark in in a, a, on a stamp in Germany. Okay, Pisces. I hope this is still okay. I do it very fast. Okay, I didn't get it. Pisces is about 
melting down the boundaries. It's like, you know, you don't want to have any difference. You want to, it's like going to a big bath, into a big bathtub. It's like feeling connection with everything that's around you. It's, it's not separation. It's the opposite of separation. Pisces hates separation. You know, it's sick. So this is Eugène Carrière. This is like just an overview. It's a French painter, painter of the, the end of the 19th century. He's not that well known and incredibly underrated, but I think in the, in the air epoch, he will be reconsidered. So this is like, you see the composition, you see the feeling, but it's always almost kind of dissolving into a foggy situation. This is so Neptunian without being kitschy. This is very dangerous. You know, when you have a strong Neptune in your chart and you have the desire of things melting down, but you don't have a knowledge or you don't have a, you're, you're not strongly talented, it's easy to make things that are awfully kitsch. So this is uh, maternité, it's called, it's motherhood. It's about the relationship of a mother to a, the child. This again, so you see there's, it's hardly anything there anymore. It's a bit, you know, there's a certain similarity to Tintoretto as well. You know, the guy with the, with the clouds and, and, you know, these decomposed compositions. But it's like almost at the edge of something that's almost not there anymore, but there's yet enough that it's a painting. Eugène Carrière. And then we have Anish Kapoor. Anish Kapoor is an Indian guy who was born in Bombay, Bombay, but he's a, an English citizen. So he's considered to be a British contemporary sculptor. And um, Anish has been doing when he, in, like in the 80s, he's been doing very symbolic um, Indian sculptures. They sometimes look like cookies, you know, things you can eat, sweets. And uh, this is something people, some people might have seen. This is in, I think it's in the United States. Um, he has done this, these big sculptures. And the idea is that you, the whole world is mirrored in the sculpture. So that you have a completely different perspective on the real world around you, seeing this world mirrored on the surface. He has done huge installations and some of them, and this is hard to see here, because you see there's something like a filter going into the wall and um, the red is just dry, it's not, it's pigment, but it has a very dry, opaque surface. And when you stand in front of it, there's a permanent shift where you feel it's like a surface or all of a sudden it goes deep into it. So his, his work is very often about the game between surface and depth. And so his work is very, very mystic. And um, this is a big building sculpture in Japan, and it's called the womb, which is also very beautiful because this is where we come from. And Pisces is on some levels the face before, you know, when you look at a chart and we have a strong 12th house placement, it can give us information about what was happening before we were born. And at the same time, it gives us information about unresolved business that's going to wait for us at the end of our life. That's what I said about Gerd Richter with Saturn at the end of his life. He's getting a Saturnian sense of the reality that he never knew and that he thought is not important. And so his work is, this is really crazy, this stuff. And um, his work is about this. That's why he makes these little details, like a physical detail, such, such an enormous, um, um, in such an enormous dimension, because it's about the memory of what is really important, where life begins, where life ends. And he has done a lot, a lot of very, very interesting work. So um, Anish Kapoor, I think he's one of the most interesting contemporary artists. And he has done very beautiful work um, where you always feel it's like the edge of, do I really see what I see or don't I see what I see? 
Can I trust my perception? But not on an intellectual level. It's something because it's with color, um, you have to see an original. So I hope you will have an opportunity in the future to see some of his work in real life. I would end here because I have some more stuff, but it's too much for now, for today. So I come back to you. Where you? Where are you? We are here, absolutely stunning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> it was can you hear me? Question. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. It was a question from Katarzyna. What was the name of painter Sagittarius uh, Taurus? And this, this is a Piscean end. We just dissolve. <laughs> Thank oh, you I very wrote, much. Oh, I can I read some of the comments. I wrote this name on the chat. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much, Alex. It was very inspiring, and you know um, we saw this uh, this uh, Chicago eye. You can, you can we can see and study astrology everywhere. Yeah. You know, we just, it's everywhere at work. And, and art is such a great um, possibility to, uh, to study astrology and look at the archetypes at work. Plus, uh, it's simply beautiful. I mean, yeah. what can we do? But the the idea that the space on the build on the picture or so, on the painting uh, is astrologically uh, determined, it's very interesting because you could extrapolate it to the other fields of uh, life. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you <laughs> you see. Uh, uh, I know. I don't know through your so in uh, case you can signs, still maybe, see me. The space. Mm -hmm. I wanna. I wanna thank. Isa and Milka. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've known each other for quite some years. I am the biggest admirer of them. <laughs> and they Thank do you, such Alex. an incredible work for astrology. And they are both wonderful lecturers. Thanks. <laughs> and they are so passionate about, uh, passionate about astrology. And I can tell you, you know, it's hard to find people that are so passionate about something and they are. And so I'm delighted and so thankful that Thank I you. could <laughs> Thank you, do this presentation you for you tonight. So big supporter of our Polish and, um, community. We'll see <laughs> if we can still exchange some words or whatever. We hope so. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. And we thank you that you support our Polish astrological community and you're always willing to, to speak to us about your magnificent astrological ideas. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank today. You <laughs> thank you very much for the audience.